It's really hard to throw a football as an Australian. It actually, well, okay, there you go. That's the thing. <laughs> did you ever play Australian reels football as a kid? I did. I played all up and all through my youth. That was kind of my sport growing up. Really? But it's different. It's different. Australian football is yeah, you're not you're not throwing the ball, you're kicking it. You're right, you're kicking it and just and then and beating the crap out of each other, right? Exactly. We don't wear helmets either. Right. Uh, which I think is actually safer, weirdly, because you're not leading with your head. Uh, but yeah, it's uh I don't think I don't think the I don't think American football is going to be my thing going forward. Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Happy Hour. I'm Connor Rogers alongside Matthew Berry, Jay Croucher, right off Super Bowl week. Boys, another NFL season in the books, a thrilling Super Bowl that we are going to recap today. We are, and it's our first one. It's it's our first season. It's our first season together. It's my first season at NBC, um, at Peacock, and uh, what a way to end it. it we we will get into all of that. Yeah. An it awesome was great. game. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot today. Besides that, we're going to go through your way too early fantasy rankings. Okay. Your way too all early out. NFL futures. My just on time NFL draft review uh, to kick off draft season as well. But let's start with the Super Bowl here, guys. We know it's all about the Chiefs, but Barry, the only way we can kick this off is with your ride or die with maybe his best game ever as a pro. So let's be clear. I believe my superpower, right? And I've got a few. I don't have many. There's very little in this world that I'm good at. But one thing that I'm great at, one thing that I'm great at is taking any subject and somehow, some way, making it about me. And you're like, I don't know, Barry. This is about the Super Bowl. This is about the two best teams in the National Football League. How on earth can you make it about me? And I'm going to show you. Watch this. So this was, I feel like, the perfect Matthew Berry Super Bowl. I love this Super Bowl because, Jay, you and I picked the Chiefs all week long. Yes. We interviewed. We were out at the NFL. Uh, we, were at, we were out at the Super Bowl. We were on Radio Row. Every single NFL player that came by was like, we'd ask him for prediction at the end of the interview. They all picked the Eagles. Everyone. Pretty much everyone was picking the Eagles. The public was on the Eagles. But Jay and I were both like, we like the Chiefs. Yes. We both talked about the Chiefs. I picked the Chiefs. Um, but Jalen Hurts is my ride or die. So what I needed to happen for me, again, just this guy, making it about myself, I needed Jalen Hurts to play awesome, to be a ride or die, to be the franchise quarterback that I said he could be and that, oh, I don't know, Chris Sims said he could not. (laughs) I needed him to do that, but then I also needed him to lose because I needed the Chiefs to win. I needed my guy Mahomes to to show up. You and I both had a lot of money on Mahomes as MVP, (laughs) so I needed all those things to happen. It was a very narrow thread that I needed. And you know what, Connor Rogers? It happened. So, yes. (laughs) Congratulations to the Matthew Berry Super Bowl, my favorite Super Bowl of all time that Washington did not win. Unbelievable. You forgot something very important, too. Rant. Your ref rant that was yes. very consistent throughout the season <laughs> and yes. ended the NFL season. Of course, of course. Every no bad hit. officiating. It was like, yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, it literally was the Matthew Berry Super Bowl. In a, in a beautiful crescendo. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Fantastic. Apparently, Travis Kelsey, uh, he doesn't watch the fantasy football happy hour talking about how no one believed in the Chiefs. Me and Matthew believed in the Chiefs. Yes, thank you. I was yeah. so annoyed at that. Like, no one believed in the Chiefs. You and I consistently, <laughs> like, Austin Eckler, Jonathan Taylor, Tyler Lockett, like, every single guy yes. that came by, Jay, what do we say to them? We like the Chiefs. We like the Chiefs. I'm starting to think Travis Kelsey doesn't know who I am. You yeah, know, I'm starting I, to get I, that I, kind of I believe yes. that. I'm trying to think, like, who else did we talk to? We talked to, like, every uh, single J- player, J- every J- single one. J- uh, James Conner, we talked to. Um, you know, like, I'm, I'm, Debo I'm, Samuel. Oh, Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel just Kittle. played these. Uh, George Kittle, Debo Samuel. Like, yeah. uh, we had a bunch of big names we had on the show. Yeah. And oh, then that's us. a big show. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, I, and, but the thing is, with Kelsey, I mean, yeah, did no one believe in the Brady Belichick Patriots either? Hey. <laughs> it was just insane. He was he's a Super Bowl favorite. His most. WWE career <laughs> after the NFL. Every I will chance he say, gets. I mean, many, most people picked the Eagles. The betting public was on the yeah. Eagle. They were actually the Eagles. They were actually favored. Seemed like a good I bet at half time. Of, I saw a lot of commentators pick the uh, pick the Eagles. I believe I w- I was at the game, so I didn't see the pregame show. But I'm told that. Pretty much all the Fox yes. commentators took the Eagles, right? Every sweep. single one. It was a sweep. Yeah. yeah. Well, then you knew the Chiefs were in. Because yep. that happens on Football Night in America. When we're all on one team, it's always the other team wins. 
Like we're like, we always like sit there and we'll, we'll go through the picks. Then we realize, cause we don't talk about our picks beforehand. So as you're going through the picks and you realize, Oh, we're all on one team. Oh, no. Like you get to the oh. end. Cause like Jason Garrett and Tony Dungy are our last two. So we're always like, guys, if somebody take somebody please else, so, you know, please, you know, like uh, get us off the hook. I, um, was, I was shocked by that. The entire two weeks leading up, forget about who you actually think is going to win the game. I was just shocked at the massive consensus behind the Eagles against Patrick Mahomes. It's like, where's the respect and for Patrick Reed. Mahomes? Like, this is what I said. And, like, I, I got, you know, I, I met a ton of fans. It was great to interact with everyone when I was out there. And I, I did a bunch of interviews on Radio Row myself. And what we said on my show and what I said to fans and what I said to just pretty much every show, the, the, the pro Chiefs argument was really four things. Because the Eagles, position by position, were better than the, the Chiefs in at, you know, every position other than quarterback and tight end. So the, the, to me, the four arguments, the, the pro Chiefs argument was really only four things, right? right. Mahomes, Mahomes over Hurts. Kelsey over Goddard, um, Andy Reid over Sirianni. Absolutely. Right? I mean, again, we talked about this. Andy Reid 10-1, and one, now 11-1, and one, mm-hmm. off of a bye with Patrick Mahomes, including playoffs uh, for his career. So 10-1, uh, and one, off of a bye. And then also just sort of experience. Yep. They've been there and done that. There's something to be said about those big moments. And as you got into the game, Jalen Hurts played awesome. And I think finally, hopefully, silenced all the critics out there We've been on him since day one. I almost wore the Hertz jersey today, as you see there. I mean, 27 to 38, over 300 yards. He has uh, he has the passing touchdown. He he runs three three touchdowns in as well. And just an unbelievable performance. 70 rushing yards as well. Made some un- crazy throws. That throw down the I don't know what, what down the distance it was, but the the Goddard throw. The Goddard one, the third the and third sixteen. Down, the third yeah. and sixteen or whatever, it's third and eighteen. Best throw of his career. The, that Goddard throw yeah. was so good in between double coverage, like had to place it perfectly, and so Hertz was just amazing, and um, you know, which it, which was awesome to see. Like I, you know, as a guy that roots for him, that he is my writer. I almost wore him today. Uh, it was you I, know, it was incredible. I think before we get but, deeper, but there were still moments. There were still moments where you saw the inexperience of the Eagles come in. Slight moments, hmm. slight moments, but, you know, it's a game of inches, right? Yeah, and I think the two things I'll remember most from this game, one is particularly in the first half, it felt like the Eagles were playing a different sport. Just with the ability of the offensive line and Hurts and Sirianni's aggressiveness on fourth down, it's like, this. I haven't seen this before. This is bizarre. It just felt like you just could not stop them because you have to stop them four times every single time. And it's just too hard when they can run the and ball the I way they thought, can. thought, Jay, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's such a great point about the fourth down because I really thought them not the, the Chiefs not going yes. for it on the fourth and three or what it was yep. in, the first, uh, in the first half, and then they drive for the field goal and Butker you know, close, clanks it yeah. off. I thought that was such a stark contrast to Sirianni being so aggressive. Sirianni being so aggressive, and I thought, oh man, that's going to come back to haunt them. Yep. And it was the fact that they were so effective, and they're using you know third and five just to get into fourth and one, fourth and two, and they're just using run plays on third and five, and just the knowledge of their team and their strengths, and the fact that you know as someone who backed the Chiefs and was cheering for the Chiefs, the Eagles went 13 to 20 on third and fourth down, and a lot of those they converted all their fourth downs, and a lot of those third down failures were just kind of intentional to get yes. them closer four fourth down and it's just like we just can't kill these guys just can't get off the field on third down or on fourth down and the throw from Hurts to Goddard that was when I was like are we ever going to get the ball back yes uh, as the Chiefs and then the second thing is is what a joy to bet on Patrick Mahomes in a big game it was just when he's the underdog yes it was just it's one of the great joys I highly recommend everyone do it uh and the fact that even when they were down 10 at halftime and it really felt like the game was over Eagles were minus 410 on the money line on BetMGM at halftime and Mahomes had the ankle and in all the text threads I'm in it's like oh the game's over I'm like Let's just see what Mahomes looks like on the first drive. Because if he's 80%, then we can win. Because it's Patrick Mahomes. And, and sure enough, we won. I mean, I actually said to people at, 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 uh, at halftime, I, I actually thought about putting more money on it. You and I both have a significant amount yes. of money. Different levels for us. Um, uh, you're more of a gener- degenerate than I am. But you and I both uh, had a significant amount of money on the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, Mahomes to win uh, and, uh, MVP, and a number of other prop bets that we gave out throughout the week. But I just sort of thought, I, I turned to my, my, uh, my buddy, so I went with my wife and I, I'm sitting next to a, a co-worker, and I turned to him and I said, doesn't it feel like, the, I know it says 10 on the scoreboard, but doesn't it feel like the Eagles should be up like three touchdowns? Yes, yes. And I said, the fact that they're only down 10 after first half in which Philadelphia dominated start to finish, and I get that they got lucky with a 
lucky with the one defensive touchdown. Yes. That's the point. You know what I mean? Like, they should be blowing them out. And the fact they're only down 10, I actually think the Chiefs have a chance, assuming Mahomes, you know, gets shot up or whatever, whatever Mr. Miyagi magic they did on that leg uh, during halftime. Yeah, that magic is certain something. Uh, I won't even have to say what it is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. shot up with, but we know. <laughs> so Mahomes is the first player in NFL history to win multiple championships and multiple league MVPs within his first six seasons. I mean, to put it in perspective, Mahomes is on track right now on track to be the greatest quarterback of all time in this sport. He's got a long way to go, Yeah, but he's at the age where there's so much left on the table for him. This is an unprecedented start to a career. It, I mean, it's magical. I mean, and honestly, like, I don't know that Andy Reid gets enough credit. Mahomes is something special. But again, if you – Mahomes – when Mahomes was drafted, like, I think he was drafted 10th overall. Yeah. And Connor, you yep. can talk about this because this is something you do, you, do, you, you do for years. And for years, you were the lead draft analyst for Bleach Report. About Think about Mahomes coming out of college, right? I, I believe – let's not do your job. You tell me if I'm wrong. But I feel like the thing was, like, big arm – inaccurate, raw, there's something there, right? I mean, like, Cliff Kingsbury went under 500 with Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. I mean, in, in the college, Big 12. Texas Tech. Mahomes right. was playing in the Big 12 in a spread offense. I mean, an offense where almost nothing at the time would translate to what he had to do to the NFL. When the Chiefs took him, the thought was, this guy needs a redshirt year behind Alex Smith, where he's yes. just watching and learning everything. And I'd heard behind the scenes those first couple months, he really didn't need that. He was not ready to come in and play. So, perfect situation, perfect coaching. And Mahomes, to his credit, uh, unprecedented work at their ethic meet, uh, meets talent, put it all together after that redshirt year. So for everybody that says you have to play right away, Patrick Mahomes is the perfect example against that right Listen, now. Listen, Patrick Mahomes is, is talented, and Patrick Mahomes was going to be like a good player in the NFL, period, wherever he went. But if he doesn't go to Kansas City, if he doesn't get Andy Reid as his coach, if he doesn't have somebody like Alex Smith to be like, you know what, I'm a good dude, and I'm not threatened. Yeah. Yes, I will take you under my wing. If he doesn't have those things, he doesn't become – Patrick Mahomes in capital letters potentially going to be the greatest quarterback of all time. Not I, as quickly. I, I strongly yes. feel like, yeah, no, I mean, a yep. thousand percent. Like, there's a there's a viral clip, and I forget what show it was on, but I, it might have been The Shop or something like that. But he's in a barber shop. So I don't know if it was actually The Shop, but um, uh, the show The Shop on, on YouTube that LeBron and Maverick Carter do. But I don't know if uh, – but he was, in, he was in a barber's chair. I just remember this talking about the fact that like he didn't really learn to read defenses until yeah. like his second year like that he was just he, you know he was mostly just a first read guy yep. and an instinct guy and it wasn't until like year two or year three in the NFL as a starter year two is like as a starter not like because his first year he sat behind Alex Smith except for one game but it wasn't until like his second year or third year in the league as a starting quarterback that he really started to understand what he was seeing out there yeah and I think look Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time, but I don't think anyone actually thinks that Tom Brady is better at playing quarterback than like peak Aaron Rodgers, just in terms of pure right. talent. But Brady had the better career by far. And Mahomes now has the, the opportunity to basically have the talent of Aaron Rodgers and potentially the career of Tom Brady, which would clearly make him the greatest of all time. Well, but it's still early. And, and, and I think, like, I mean, it, you know, we're still in the afterglow, but I think that when we look back on this Super Bowl, we will, we will not only remark about Mahomes' greatness and, and that second half. You know, my friend Bill Barnwell over at ESPN uh, wrote an article, which is terrific. I highly yes. recommend it. But, um, but Barnwell just talked about, like, that was a perfect second half. That yes. might have been, you know, one of the greatest second halves in Super Bowl history, if not the greatest Super Bowl, second half in Super Bowl history, because it was completely flawless in terms of the play calling and the execution and how Mahomes played. But when you think about... When you think about this, like, so not only did Mahomes win his second Super Bowl before the age of 27, his second Super Bowl MVP, but he does it without Tyree Kill. That was one of the big questions. Well, you don't have Tyree Kill anymore, right? And, and so they didn't even have Miko Hardman. Not that Miko Hardman is, is all that, but, like, you, you know, you, you think about some of the, the heroes out there other than Kelsey. Kelsey's awesome, right? But they had, they had a seventh-round rookie running back. From Rutgers. Lead, from Rutgers. <laughs> Rutgers leading the way. Like, you know, a seventh-round rookie running back out well. there. And Jarek McKinnon, who's bounced around the league, th th those are the two running backs there. Um, they, had, uh, they had Kadarius Coney, Tony, who was a cast-off from, from the New York Giants. Juju Smith-Schuster, who, Sh Smith who I believe is on a one-year prove-it yep. deal. Who's like, on a, you know, like the Steelers are like, whatever. Like, who's like, and he was less than 100%. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who... Again, was not like a hot free agent when he coming out of yeah. Green Bay last year. Like, they didn't have – it's not like 
It's not like he's back there with uh, with Tyreek. It's just with, 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 Tyreek. With, or with Tyreek and Jalen Waddle. Yeah, or something like AJ that. AJ Brown and Devontae Smith. Smith. Yes, <laughs> I mean, I mean, a hundred percent. Like you could easily make the argument, and I think you could. AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard as a trio are better than Travis Kelsey and any other two yep. skilled players you want to give on the Chiefs. Like, yep. and so it's just a credit to Mahomes. Um, uh, you know, the fifty-one yard run. Is like, you know, again, like, we're like, oh, like, he's going to be back there on one leg. And he was just like, I don't care. You know, I mean, yeah. like, unbelievable. He, and to me, what I'll remember most just in terms of a stat from this Super Bowl, it was that the Eagles pressured Mahomes on 35% of his dropbacks and he didn't get sacked once. To be right. on the ankle like that and be under pressure at, that's, that's more than the Eagles pressure on an average rate. Like, the Eagles pass rush got to him. It's just that he was so good with his awareness, being able to navigate the pocket, and just being able to complete throws as well. He had one to Kelsey where he's falling down as he's throwing it, still completes it for effectively a first down. And to go on that scramble at the end to evade Hassan Reddick <laughs> on, on one leg is just insane. Coming into the game, no team in the NFL, including playoffs, had more sacks than the Philadelphia Eagles. And I loved, I believe it was Orlando Brown after the game. Zero sacks. Put that on a t-shirt. Yeah. Right? Again, and some of that is due to the, the line. Give the line credit. Yes. They stepped up in a massive way against a formidable uh, Eagles defensive line. But also to your point, Mahomes. Just, uh, you know, the elusiveness, the pocket awareness, the brilliance of Mahomes. All of it, like, incredible. And yet still, by the end of the game, they needed, they needed a, you know, they needed a field goal with time remaining. And I thought it, it was... You know, when uh, when the Eagles tied it up, when the Eagles tied it up, I turned to my buddy and I said, five and a half minutes left, five minute drive, do not give the ball back to the yep. Eagles. And so that was that was where the pl- the the uh, the holding call on James Bradbury came into play because otherwise they were going to have to score. Yep. They could have scored a touchdown, right? I mean, yep. like um, McKinnon got down. McKinnon got answer. down, took a knee on the one, pulled up Brian Westbrook, if you will, um, and. Uh, and, you know, I, I think they wanted him to score at that point. Yeah, they like, were letting him go in. Because yeah. the, if I'm the Eagles, by the way, wouldn't, don't you think the Eagles would have gone down, likely scored a touchdown, and gone for two? Yeah. It, with I Sirianni, so. absolutely. I think so. Particularly yeah. with how effective they'd run the ball in short yardage with Hurts all game. And I think there's, it's funny when you have a big bet on a team and you just kind of you, you kind of just going to focus in on certain aspects of the game. Just little things like when McKinnon, after he took that slide and then they're kind of bleeding the clock and Mahomes kind of is just, he's just waddling around and takes the five yard loss. Yeah. I'm like, do we need to lose five yards when Harrison Butker's already b- almost missed the PAT yeah. and missed the 42 yarder? We really need to do that, Patrick? Just really get in the swing of it. But Connor, I'm interested what you think, because I thought the Eagles, I thought they started, look, Sirianni was magnificent. Hertz was magnificent. Those guys are legends for what they did in the Super Bowl. But I thought in the fourth quarter, they started to get a little bit shaky. I thought the blitz call from Gannon on the Skymore touchdown, that was weird. Also, I don't understand why when they are trying to tie it up down 35-27, why are they running the play clock down to one over and over again? You guys might need to score twice. It felt like they started to, the experience might have started to show a little bit. It really did. And you make a great call about the play clock, whether it was when they got hit with delay games or whether they got hit with having to call a timeout. And at the end of the day as well, when you let the play clock drain like that, it lets every single member of the defensive line give the green light of yep. when they can go and get off the ball. So. It's an experience thing, and it's, yes. we're seeing the Eagles staff, as lack of experience as they have, start to get poached. The Colts hired Shane Steichen as we record this podcast. That happened today, uh, so he will be their head coach. Arizona's in a final stage with Gannon, their defensive coordinator. So it, these are young guys that they were in the heat of the moment against Andy Reid, who's been there, Patrick Mahomes has been there, and then the guys that don't get a lot of credit, Chris Jones has been there plenty of yeah, times yeah. on that Chiefs defense. Yep. So, yeah, absolutely, when it came down to it, it makes me wonder, guys, do you think in our lifetime now, as long as Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes are together, will they ever not be the preseason Super Bowl betting favorite ever, ever again? Yeah, well, I mean, not for, you wouldn't expect for the next couple of years at least. It's difficult to project out three, four years. I mean, there's just so many great quarterbacks in the AFC. You're going to have one of these off seasons where Burrow or Herbert or Allen they start to get superstar yeah. uh, upgrades. But I mean, it's, Mahomes is going to be the guy for a while. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's so hard to. I uh, guess I, I would I would argue yes, there will be times because it it all depends on we're we're especially like a a you know moment you know in the moment kind of thing. I mean, at this time last year. Everyone was saying the Bills were the preseason Super Bowl favorite, right? Yep. Even after the yeah. even after the Rams By win far, last year over the over the Bengals, and and so assuming the Chief, if the Chiefs don't win next year, and it's so hard to repeat, right? I mean, uh, it's so hard to repeat. Assuming the Chiefs don't win next year, like don't you think? Right to your point, you've got Josh Allen and you've got Joe Burrow, and 
You've got Jalen Hurts. I mean, here that's the other thing about Philadelphia. Philadelphia is loaded. Yes, they are. Lo- they are young and they are loaded, and they've got they've got cap room and they've got some good draft picks. Like I mean, Philadelphia is um, is set up for long term success here, and and we haven't even talked about the fact that. You know, the Niners came this close with like, yeah, I mean, right? With Brock Purdy. With Brock Purdy. With a seventh string quarterback. I mean, like seventh round quarterback. Both. Seventh string, seventh <laughs> round. Every, like say. everything. So, I mean, you know. The parody of the NFL, yes. Any given, any, given, any given Sunday. Yeah, and we're only, you know, a year removed from Mahomes completely blowing the AFC title game to the Bengals. Like, it does change quickly. Uh, and Joe Burrow certainly will have something to say about the future of the AFC. But, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very, very fun conference. Also, Lamar Jackson still probably plays in that conference. Uh, right. Unanimous MVP. For now, in he does. For, yes. for, for, now, for now, he does. Ravens also, by the way, real quickly as we're talking news, yes. Todd Munkin hired as their offense coordinator. He's been bounced around. I like Munkin as a He's play caller a lot. Very good. Very, very good. creative. So I like the call a lot. We'll see if Lamar likes the call a lot. He may not have a choice because the franchise. So we'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought that was a good move for the Ravens offense uh, as well. Uh, question for you guys, because one last thing we didn't really talk about, and I've bitched about the, uh, uh, the, the officiating all season long. Where were you guys on the last call, the, the, the holding call on Bradbury, which was clearly a hold. Yes. He grabs Jersey. Bradbury, after the game, said, I held him. But it was very momentarily, it was kind of ticky-tack. Juju Smith-Schuster is not a guy who wins on speed, so it matters less with a guy like Juju than it would like Miko Hardman or MVS trying to get loose, right? You know, he's not a guy who wins on speed, so Mike, I'm curious, where you guys landed? I think in the moment and in the immediate aftermath, I think Greg Olson probably gave a voice to most of America where it's like, yeah, that's technically a penalty, but it's not really one that you call. It didn't feel like one, but then on replay, when you see the tug, when there's a tug, I think it just has to be called a penalty. So I'm okay with the call. Certainly as the Chiefs better, I'm okay with the call. But Same. I think that was the right call. It was the right call. The problem always comes back to this, guys, the consistency issue. Yes. I'm, Correct. You can, and I haven't personally done this. I'm sure you can go back on the All-22 and find Brad. That's how Bradbury plays, by the way. He's always played this way. Right. That same play probably exists at least five times. Well, Juju got more blatantly held earlier in the game in the first half, and they didn't call that. So I get that, that the consistency wasn't there, right. and that, it, that would it, be if, the if argument. You let him, if you let him play for three and a half quarters, you got to let him play the whole game. Yeah, Super Bowl. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the and same that was thing th- in, like, basketball, where, you know, some games, guys are just gonna, like the Miami Heat are just going to set moving screens every single time unless the ref calls it. And then if you establish the baseline of consistency, then you adjust the way you play. And so that would be the thing, that there wasn't that consistency. To, to me, that's, that's the issue. Is like, and it, you know, you hate to see that happen. I, I'm with you, like, as a Chiefs better, as somebody who predicted the Chiefs, who wanted this to work out the way it did, because, again, making it all about me <laughs> is my superpower. I, um, I was happy with the call, but I don't agree with it. To your point, yes, it is technically a hold. It just feels like, but you need to call that throughout the game. It wasn't as egregious to me. It wasn't as, egre- as egregious as the call against the Bengals last year in the Super Bowl. I thought that should not have been called at all. Yes, I think that one was worse. And the thing is, is like if you showed that, if you showed that play to me and told me the context and asked me to set a market on whether that's going to be called a penalty or not in the last two minutes in the Super Bowl, I would have said plus five hundred that gets called. That's not going to get called. Not in the yeah. last two minutes of the Super Bowl. So you know, but it was a penalty. So it's by textbook, it's the right call. It's yeah, just no, a matter 100%. of the moment. It's just the it's just the matter of the moment. It's yeah, it's it's like, but if you and if you'd made that call throughout the game, okay. You were there. What was the reaction in the stadium to that call? I was sitting in a, a gr- with Eagles fans, and they were all <laughs> oh, just yeah. like, uh, they, they were not happy. They didn't start flipping you over? Or they did not yeah. start flipping me over. They were actually very reasonable uh, Eagles fans. Like, yeah. I liked all the guys that I was sitting with uh, just around me. They were very upset. But they were also, they were also like, um, you can't, it can't come down to that. It can't, you know, it yeah. can't come down to that. You know, they were like, they're all just sort of silent, right? You know, it was very fact, deflating. It was very, very deflating. Very deflating. But the truth is, is that, okay, even if it doesn't get called, so then it's what? It's fourth down or third down? I forget. It was fourth down. It's that fourth, was it's fourth down, down. It's fourth field down. Goal. They kick the field goal and then they got to get a stop. Yep. So, and at yeah. that point, the game is probably pick. Honestly, it's a coin flip at that time because the Eagles, they still have enough time and a timeout to be able to march down the field and potentially score the touchdown to win it. I think they were out of timeouts, though. No, they had one. They had one. They did have one? Yeah, they had one. So I think that at that point, it's pretty much a coin flip. Certainly feels like they would have marched down based on... Nobody was getting a stop in the second half, I felt like. So I think that's why everybody was upset. Yeah. 
No, uh, it makes it makes a ton of sense. But you still got to do it. Yeah, you still got to go down. Do you still got to make a field goal to to tie the game at yes. the Super Bowl on on a shoddy field. Like we've heard yep. so much talk from the players on both sides that how slippery it was, and maybe that that contributed to the Butker miss in the first half, right? You know, that just hard to get uh, that plant foot down consistently. I so you hate to see a game like that come down to that. But if it does have to come down to a ticky tack foul like that, where there's controversy. On the plus side, it happened on the side that Jay and I had bet <laughs> yes, on. Yes, that sounded So at least, at least Jay and I made a lot of money yes, on that. I love if, the refs. If it's going to happen, yes. right? You know, it, it, we love the refs. We do. There has to – that's the biggest thing. I'll just say this. I mean, I've been ranting all year long. Consistency. There yep. has to be consistency. And to me, that to me, the way you do that – because you're always going to have different officials. You're always going to have different officials game to game to game. But my very simple solution, and you tell me this is whether – whether this uh, you agree with this, but I don't think either one of these things are hard. Number one is officials should be full-time employees. It's a multi-multi-billion-dollar mm-hmm. company, right? They should be full-time employees. Their entire job is being a referee on Thursday, Sunday, Monday, whatever it is. And what that means is like whether it's they're on Zoom calls all week, they're looking at the two teams that they play. This team plays physical. This team plays this. This team. So they know they've they've got a whole week to prepare for the game, to know what they're going to be looking for, how certain players st- – to your point, if Bradbury's always playing like that, okay, are we calling this or are we not? We're not. And if That's we it. are calling this, okay, we need to call it early so that they know. You know, like, have those conversations. Because right now they all have jobs. That's what people don't get is that referees have actual jobs. Yep. And it's just like, okay, you know, 5 o'clock on, at 5 o'clock on Friday they leave whatever it is, their insurance company <laughs> that they run, and they're like, okay – See ya, honey. I'm off to I'm off to Phoenix for the Super Bowl. It's a little bit like I it's swear to God, the Super Bowl. Right? Yeah. Let me just. Uh, hey, is my you know is my uh, black and white jersey? Did you press? That? Did you iron it? Hi, yes. Did you iron it, honey? Like where is it? I see nothing but the kids' jerseys. What's going on? So it's literally some version of that. So number one is full time employees where they their entirely focus is on like okay here's what we're going to be looking for here's where we're going to call the game and the the teams can work together right and talk about this through. And then the second thing is is consistency on uh, the replay assist. When oh, it gets yeah. called, like, yeah. you know, like, it, it needs to be all the time or never because it does feel like sometimes they'll buzz down and sometimes they don't. And it doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason to that. Replay assist. It's like HAL in uh, 2001 A Space right. Odyssey. It's kind of like this evil computer that just kind of surfaces sometimes. Sometimes it's And not everybody's bad. waiting for the yeah. moment right. for the whistles to blow to stop. And then sometimes it just doesn't happen. And you're like, so we're yeah. just moving on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it just. No rhyme or reason. Yeah, it just it just feels like you know well, the got it the got it play was that was the one where it's like Andy Reid's got now four minutes to decide and then blows at the last minute. Yes, right? I thought also was that definitely a catch? Yeah, it was. Uh, there was a lot going on in that game. For and, the and the other thing is, is that I and the, and the last thing I'll say is that I think they need help. I think the referees need help from the broadcast company networks. You know, and the, and the, the partners of the NFL and that includes us here at NBC. And, and I don't and it's less for us than it is for the other networks and, and the reason is because we broadcast one game a week and so uh, Sunday Night Football has as many cameras as I believe is any game uh, that's broadcast but I feel like every single game should have multiple camera angle angles and that they all need to be broadcast the same to your point there's sometimes where it's just like a team hurries up and runs and you get one look at it or the broadcast you know different networks do it differently and some broad some broadcasts will like, you know, show like four or five replays of a controversial call, and some will be like, ah, you know, it was probably in, and then three plays later, they're like, hey, let's take another look at that, whether that was a catch or not. And you're like, you know what I mean? So I think there needs to be consistency in terms of the broadcast, or at least time, for both teams and New York to look at it. And I feel like that's inconsistent based on the number of cameras at the broadcast, uh, for, uh, you know, the, the fifth game on CBS that's at 1 o'clock, right, you know, doesn't necessarily get the same amount of attention as a Monday Absolutely. night football, Sunday night football, or Thursday night football game. And so that needs to be, that, that needs to be the NFL talking to the broadcast partners and saying, hey, if you're, if you're broadcasting one of our games, this is what it needs to be. Yep. This is how many cameras it needs to be, and this is how it needs to be uh, shot. So that's, my, that's how you fix officiating. There you go. Matthew Berry <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you're on it. Matthew Berry for president of officiating. It's done. <laughs> done. Done and done. Yeah. I would like your vote. Thank you yeah. for coming. My, thank you for coming to my TED yeah, talk. Yeah, that'd be a good cue to go to break. So we don't have any breaks today. So no breaks. We just get to go on about this forever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One last thing on the Super Bowl. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a new friend of the show. You have a new friend of the show, Paul, or is he an old friend? Well, he's an old friend, but yes. new friend. So, so anyway, like they wanted me to like, 
So, you know, Stephen, so, you know, our producer, Stephen. Yeah, I know. Let me set yeah, this I've up for you. Let me set this up for you, <laughs> okay. Connor. So, at the very beginning of Super Bowl week, so Jay and I get in late sun, sat, Sunday night, and then we're broadcasting for radio Monday morning. And he's just like, uh, hey, talk about all your wacky adventures in Phoenix. And I'm like, I went from the airport to the hotel, I checked in, and I went to bed. I said, the, the only thing that I had was, you know, uh, you know, so anyway, like, I, you know, I got, uh, I, I, had, I had one, you know, I had, I had one encounter uh, that was funny, and you can go back to my Sunday show. Yeah. So I, I, we talked that story. That was Ryan Burke too, but whatever. Stephen and Ryan, they're cut from the same producer cloth. <laughs> they all, they all, you know, whatever. They all, they're sure they're not like same. Alabama running backs. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly, just, exactly. Yes. They're in the same in school. I view them as the school. same person. Yeah, to me, yeah. they're the same person. Yeah, yeah they're pretty I say much are. Different, yeah. A thousand percent. <laughs> one likes the Jaguars, <laughs> yes. and I forget which one. I, you know what? It's they run together. Anyway, so. But over the course of the week, we had a lot of fun, and we ran into a bunch of people. And that's the great thing about the Super Bowl is you run into a ton of people. So uh, there were a couple of things that he asked that since we left the show Friday till now, our last show was Friday, uh, there were a couple of things. And so uh, one of the things I did is on Saturday, I went to the Fanatics party. Fanatics r runs a really an epic Super Bowl party years after years after years. And uh, Fanatics have been great friends to me and so kind. Uh, and literally like all the jerseys you see behind us, the jersey I'm wearing now is courtesy of our friends at Fanatics. So we appreciate that. Appreciate Michael Rubin. And so uh, just at the party, I ran into a friend of mine that I've been in a number of fantasy leagues with. And we can, uh, we can show the photo right here. So, uh, so we all talk and we took a photo. Oh, so that is, is. Uh, just two guys in the MCU, you know, like... Obviously of equal importance. It's myself and Ant Man. Uh, there you go. So Paul Rudd was there. That is more Paul, superpowers. That actually. is Paul Rudd's son, the the very young guy on uh, uh, wearing the uh, the blue suit, if you will. Uh, by the way, uh, I guess I'm trying to figure it left to right. Is it my left to right or whatever? Uh, it's uh, Scott Coffin Ross who runs betting and fantasy for the NBA. Next to me, that isn't Kenny. Uh, that isn't Paul Rudd. Is Kenny Gersh who uh, does the same and a lot more for Major League Baseball. And then next to Paul Rudd, between Paul and his son, is Matt King, who's the former CEO of FanDuel and now runs all betting over at Fanatic. So a great group. We we're all hanging out. We were talking football, baseball, basketball, and, of course, villains in the MCU. I was once on a negotiation call with, uh, with Kenny Gersh, and the entire call he had a baseball bat in his hand, just ba like kind of bouncing it against his hand. It was very intimidating. Something I highly recommend for anyone who's ever in negotiation to have an actual baseball bat. It's very right, effective. Kenny Gersh is one of my all-time dear friends who uh, Kenny Gersh used to like, – this is probably 15 years ago uh, – that Kenny Gersh was at CBS Sportsline, mm -hmm. and I was trying to get my talented Mr. Roto site off the ground – and Kenny Gersh uh, arranged for us to do some content, my talented Miss Roto site for CBS Sportsline. So Kenny's literally been a friend for a, a long, long time. Uh, he's a dear friend, and uh, it, is a t it is a story for another time, but uh, there is, uh, Kenny and I have an epic story of me, Kenny, and Kevin Euclid. All of us wow, very, the great god of walks. That. All of us very drunk uh, in the back of a cab after an MLB All Star game. Wow, so um, um, uh, anyway, but anyway, so the, the group of us all uh, were there at the Fanatics party, just uh, chatting. And uh, uh, Paul, anyway, Paul Rudd, of course, a very well known Chiefs fan. He was there oh, yeah. with his son. He's also a hardcore fantasy football player. I'm, I've been in a bunch of leagues with him over the years, uh, including the the Agbo Superhero League. He's a very good fantasy player as well. So uh, we talked some fantasy football in Chiefs, and uh, anyway, I was happy for Paul. Last uh, last thing on Phoenix, I don't think I've even told you about this. So I had a big bet on Kyle Shanahan to win Coach of the Year at forty to one. We yes, talked about did. it on yeah. the show, and he loses to to Brian Dayball uh, during bias. the the NFL Honors uh, on Thursday night by uh, effectively three first place votes, and so right. that was bad. But what was worse was uh, my flight home the next day. You know, sitting in the seat directly in front of me on the flight home. Brian Dayball. Brian Dayball. <laughs> oh, that's and uh, Brian Dayball, uh, who's a... Now, the worst thing is he seems like a lovely man, uh, which kind of makes <laughs> it worse. He was very kind. He, uh, but he kind of hard reclined right into oh, me, knocked no. my kale salad off, uh, off my plate, uh, which I didn't care for. And then every single person on the plane, except for me, asked for a selfie with Brian Dayball. And so they're going up to him and saying, congratulations on Coach of the Year. Well-deserved coach. <laughs> Just over and over again. I'm right behind him trying to recoil out of these selfies. Was everyone telling him he deserved it. And I want to be like, what about Kyle Shanahan? He took Brock Birdie no. to six and a half. No. Okay. A couple of things. All right, a couple of things. A couple of things. First off, <laughs> no. I love Brian. Brian Dayball is incredibly nice. He's uh, incredibly, in, in, in Just an incredibly cool dude. Just and annoying. I have a funny Dayball story, which I'll tell in a second. 
secondly, and I think Connor and I will agree on this, and you know I will. Like, by the way, him knocking your kale salad <laughs> off, that's not a flaw, that's a feature. <laughs> he did that you a favor. That, he did yes. you a favor. That's kale right. salad on a plane. No, that, thank you very much. Where like, was that kale yeah, from the exactly. cargo pit? Did you bring a kale salad onto no, the plane? No, it was plane? just like one of those kind of generic kind of accompanying salads as part of the main meal. It wasn't like a central part of the meal. Terrifying. The flavor was chicken terrifying. breast, uh, and terrifying. then, yeah, it was just that. But oh, now, my God. Right anyway, so good, it. good for you, Brian Dable, on that. And third, I think you have a massive missed opportunity because what I would have done, if I was Jung Jay Crouch, you know what I've done? As people called up, um, as people came up and got the, um, uh, you know, were like, oh, Coach Dable, I, uh, I can't believe, you know, you won Coach of the Year. Yeah. I would have just been behind them doing this same thing. Can, can you get me a close to this? Get me on one? I don't know, can you read that? This is Kyle, Kyle got, got robbed. robbed. I would just be like holding up them in the back of every selfie. With a straight face. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, like like a mushroom. Orange. Just like you know, <laughs> yeah. flip the bird or something like that. You should have been in every single one of those selfies. Just like you know, like kind of like a. Yeah, it was uh, a missed opportunity. It would have <laughs> been I mean? funny if he turned around at or one just point like, well, and was like, "You don't want that, a selfie, you know?" Like just something. Would have been strange after the fourth one when Brian Dayball was turning around. Like, Who is this guy? Who is this guy? And what's yeah. wrong you with know. him? Anyway, tough for, save, tough save for me. But yeah, sorry. Th- congratulations to Brian Dayball and Coach of the Year. Uh, you did a yes. good job. One other, one other one. I think that so this was cool. So, um, you know, one of the things about fantasy and the fact that I've been on ESPN for, uh, you know, 8 billion years and now I'm on NBC is that uh, when, when a celebrity wants to play fantasy football, generally I get invited into the league, you know, and so or, or, or I'm aware of it or I have a relationship with them somehow, some way. And uh, so it's been very nice. So, but you, a lot of it's text. Like, you'd be amazed at how many people I text with all the time that I've never actually met that, uh, that, are, that are well known. And one of the people um, uh, I ran into at the Super Bowl. So I'm, I'm walking to the Super Bowl with my wife, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, Matthew. And I turn around. He goes, it's Darius. And so, uh, you know, and so Darius Rutger, of course, <laughs> Hootie and the Blowfish, you know, and a, a massive country career awesome. on his own. I've, played, I've been in leagues with Darius for, I don't know, seven, eight years. He's a hardcore fantasy football player. He's a hardcore NFL fan, as everyone knows. Loves, uh, loves his uh, South Carolina Gamecocks as well. And so um, I was like, hey, man, what's up? And so that was, this is literally the first, again, Darius and I have texted for, I want to say, six or seven years. And... Uh, or emailed and been in leagues together years and years and years of playing, and we've never actually met in person. This was uh, this was us outside the Super Bowl, just walking in. <laughs> so uh, you know, he's uh, he's great. You know, he's. A, I will say this about Darius too. He's an epic trash talker. He's okay. he's really really funny. Really really just an epic trash Hoot- talker. Hootie and the trash talk. Yeah, yes. pretty much. Yes, yes. Well, pretty who, much. Who's the most awkward league you had to pass on? Or do you just have to say yes to all of these? Like, is there a famous threshold? Yeah. Uh, like, hey, you're a C-list actor. Here's some advice, but I can't do this league. This is no, league number seven. Sorry, I, Paul Giamatti. I'm not going to be able to <laughs> well, didn't, didn't love league. Billions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I do love Billions. Um, uh, no, I don't know that I've ever passed on a league because of the level of fame. <laughs> How about that? I've passed on leagues because I have – I mean, I got invited into a um, – I got invited into a casino owner's – league where the entry fee was 100k yeah and i'm just like nah you know what <laughs> well and by the way because for variety you know for variety of reasons but by the way to me when you play for that kind of money it's not fun no, I, no, I, I don't it's stressful you know what i mean i money's always a, a weird subject but for me but then it becomes stressful yes then it becomes it becomes stressful and the other thing is is it impacts my job because every draft i go to at least one or two of the people, and usually most of the people in draft, like I walk in and they're holding my rankings. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even if they don't believe in my rankings, they know what I think. Yes. Yes. You know what I mean? And so I'm at, a dis- I'm at a yeah. disadvantage. They've seen me throw. I mean, like, again, like we made all fun of it, but even think of our show league, right? I mean, like, and I, you know, I complained about the fact that Alexa took Jalen Hurts uh-huh. for me, like, whatever, in the middle, like, w- well ahead of ADP <laughs> and in the very first round, one pick ahead of me, just because she'd heard me talk for three straight weeks and she knew I was taking Jalen Hurts. Obviously, that ended up working out for Alexa. But yeah. that happens to me in every league. And so if I was playing for whatever, you know, a quarter, of a, three quarters of, of, a, of a million dollars, which I think is what first place was, that league was, I think it was 700000 like I'm approaching my job differently because I don't yeah. want them to know. And it's just, yeah. you know. Anyway. Yeah. And then you're screaming at, like, the most simple injury. Like, your flex inj- player gets hurt, and you're just screaming at the television. Everyone's looking at you like, oh, yeah, it's not fun. Yeah, it's so not it's fun. not fun. But, but yeah, generally speaking, I'm, I'm you know, 
I'm pretty much down. I'm pretty much down. <laughs> you know, like, so if I get asked, I'm good down. Yes. Yeah. Well, to obviously. continue that competitive disadvantage, we have your way, way too early 2023 rankings. So yeah. everybody can get a head start on how to beat you in fantasy leagues sure. that they're in with you, including this show league that we think yes. will continue on for a second year. So, Barry, let's start with the running backs, of course, because there's no other place to start here. Uh, and I'm fascinated by how you're going to stack these top five, especially after – well, we have interesting free agents. Josh Jacobs is included in that list. And then, obviously, a young player on the back end in Kenneth Walker. But let's start right at the top of Christian McCaffrey. I mean, to me, I think I think as you get deeper and it gets it gets harder, right? And, and so uh, it gets more nitpicky. I don't think anyone's going to question Chris McCaffrey. In Shanahan, no. prove the health, right? Eckler too is obvious. Uh, Barkley, you know, assuming he's back with the Giants and Dayball, we expect that to be the case. He's number three. To me, it gets interesting after that, right? When you start getting into the, you know, again, Jonathan Taylor. So we just mentioned uh, Shane Stitchen is going to be the new head coach of the Colts. They need a quarterback. They need a quarterback. Yeah. And Stitchen, obviously, in Philadelphia, used a multiple running back uh, kind of co- approach. But he didn't have a Jonathan Taylor on his team. The expectation no. here is that it will be a run-heavy team. It will be a team that runs the ball effectively. And Taylor's going to get a lot of work. Jacobs at five makes me nervous. Um, he's a you – know, we interviewed him. Another guy that, by the way, picked the Eagles, I believe, yes. and uh, that we interviewed, Jay. But easy guy to root for and seems like he's coming back to the Raiders. I think that, I think would, be, that would be the betting favorite. But certainly yeah. it's just difficult because you know which team these other guys are going to be on. You know, right. the Eckler, you know their environment, whereas Josh Jacobs could theoretically go anywhere. Uh, I think that – Taylor is an interesting one because Taylor was the runaway number one pick, uh, not just consensus number one across the board going into this season. And then I think the sneaky thing with Taylor is that when he was healthy, he was fine. Like yeah. he kind of delivered on expectations. Had massive game against Houston in Week One. Had a massive game against the Raiders in Jeff Saturday's first game as coach. But just dealing with the ankle, dealing with a bad offensive line, he's terrible. got huge upside. But to me, the most interesting name on that list of ten is Kenneth Walker, where we talked to Tyler Lockett on Radio Row. And Tyler Lockett said that Ken Walker was the best rookie he'd ever seen. And that's something where, obviously, you know, you pump up your teammates, but you don't have to say that. You don't have to go to that right. extreme. And uh, obviously, his and not, explosion. By the way, not the best rookie running back he's seen. Yeah, just yeah, best, best rookie. rookie. So that includes yes. DK Metcalf. D- yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what I took away. Take yeah. that, DK. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, I think with Walker, just his explosiveness... The way he closed the season as well, even on the bum ankle, like he basically won them that game against the Rams uh, down the stretch to get them into the playoffs. He's got immense talent, immense upside. I think they can upgrade the offensive line. He is a guy, like no one would be shocked if Ken Walker's the number one running back in fantasy no, next year. That's no, in no. play. Oh, it, it's 100% in play. You know, what's interesting there is anyone else jump out to you or the top 10? Nick Chubb. Because yeah. Nick Chubb, Deshaun Watson came back and Rust was – Clearly evident. evident. You wonder what a full training camp looks like for that offense with Deshaun Watson under center. Nick Chubb was great with Jacoby Brissett at quarterback. If this offense improves with Watson, what is that going to open up for Chubb? He's somebody that could finish as a top five guy. He, he could, but he could also finish as like running back 15. I mean, think yes. about this, right? Uh, Kareem final, Hunt hits free agency uh, too. Yeah. Final eight games of the season, he had just one rushing touchdown. Now, my expectation here was Stefanski, Stefanski they're always going to run the ball, but like they've had to be – Nick Chubb doesn't catch the ball. No. His fantasy value is entirely based on three things, on volume, on touchdowns, and the fact he's just really, really good at football. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, like he's, he's one of, if not the best, pure runner in the game. Um, but, but if this offense is more open with Deshaun Watson, if it's more pass-friendly, right? I mean, we saw Donovan Peoples-Jones kind of, uh, you know, have a mini breakout this year, and obviously Amari Cooper had a very nice year. Just another system, assuming Joku's back as well. He, suddenly there's some pass catchers there yeah. in Cleveland. Deshaun Watson, we think, is going to be a very good NFL quarterback again. Um, and so do they need to run the ball as effectively? Yes, Kareem Hunt could move on, but they have Dearness Johnson, who they like a lot yeah. as well. So that's the only question is, is like instead of 22 carries a game, is he getting 17, 15 and 17? And with Deshaun Watson there, who's also a mobile quarterback, do the, do the 12 touchdowns become nine because Watson keeps three himself, some version of that? Sure. And then, so there's, there's more a wide range of outcomes with Chubb, more of a wider range of non-injury outcomes with Chubb than I think there are other guys 
in the top 10. Yeah, I think he's got a fairly high floor just because of the Correct. offensive line, but maybe a lower ceiling. I think maybe if you would take like Jonathan Taylor with your first pick at picking at five or whatever, who's very high variance, could be the best running back or could be uh, could have the season that he had this year, then Chubb is probably a good support piece for that just because he's got the high floor. Yeah, the other one that's interesting there is Joe Mixon, right? Um, you know, is so... And again, this is this is you know Florio's uh, beat more than mine. But you know, there's a scenario in which Joe Mixon is not on the Bengals next year. Obviously, there were some off the field issues again that raised its head uh, recently, and you know, seems like that got solved. Who knows though? But like, you know, Samaj P. Ryan's a really yes. good player, and they like him. And then you sort of think about the fact that they've they're going to have to pay Burrow, they're going to have to pay Jamar Chase. Like they've got some. They've got some cap they need to free up. Yeah, I think they'd rather keep that Chase T. Higgins combo for Burrow and just go cheap after cheap at running back in the yep. future. So that's one to keep an eye on. Moving on. So, and if Mixon's on another team, then that changes the equation. Yep. Moving on to wide receivers, I don't think much of a surprise at the top here with Justin Jefferson, who just is coming off a remarkable year and a remarkable start to his career. But after that, obviously, this becomes a lot, a lot more difficult, Barry, which is talent after talent after talent that I think, from, in my opinion, from two to six, this can go a lot of different ways. It really can. I mean, obviously, we're, we're banking on the fact that my little Cooper Cup comes back healthy and that Matthew Stafford does not retire. He keeps claiming he's not going to. Yeah. I still sort of don't believe it until, <laughs> you know, um, uh, until training camp opens and, and uh, you know, uh, number nine is back there under center. Devontae Adams is a, is a bank on talent. I mean, at the moment, at the moment, his quarterback is Jarrett Stidham. We don't expect that to be the case, but there's that. You could look any of these guys. That I mean, this is again, we sort of say this all 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 the time. But wide receiver is deep. You know, the, the, you know, if you wound, if you go out of a, if you leave a league, a draft, and your number one wide receiver is is Ceedee Lamb, or Mon Ross St. Brown, I think you're still feeling pretty good about your team. Yep. I think, I think a case can be made that Justin Jefferson and Cooper Cup should be the top two picks in drafts full I, stop. Yes. Um, just because McCaffrey and the San Francisco offense, maybe like, you know, they use sure. other running backs in that offense. And Cup, we have to remember, his last full healthy season last year, he was basically the greatest wide receiver season of all yeah. time. And then this year was the number one fantasy wide receiver in points per game, even with everything that was going wrong in LA. Like he is all world and then Justin Jefferson offensive player of the year obviously has an incredibly high floor and ceiling so I might even put those two as my top two yeah I mean and you see you know Hill and Waddle uh both there right I mean but they're guys that can easily sneak in like you know no Mike Evans there like Mike yeah. Evans is always you know it's a thousand yards in the bank right we don't know who his his quarterback is like is anybody gonna be shocked if if Chris Olave you know, is uh, exactly. is it sneaks into the uh, into Garrett the, uh, Wilson. Garrett he's got Wilson. Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback. Right. Offensive rookie of the year, Garrett Wilson. Yeah, they, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so Debo Samuel, of Debo course. Debo in there, yeah. right? Friend of the podcast, yeah. Debo yeah. Samuel. Friend of the show. Um, so friend of the show. Yeah. So I don't. You know. Uh, yeah. No Keenan Allen there either. So there were a lot of different. Uh, uh, you know, it was wide receiver is deep. I agree with you that Jefferson, Cupper, and Chase, I think, are in a tier by themselves. Sure. But after that. I think, you know, depending on how your draft lays out, in the second round, I don't necessarily need a, num a number one wide receiver if you went running back in the first round or Kelsey, and then you come back around and you the way it's your draft, you're like, you know, you've got, it's five picks into your next round and seven of those guys are still out there. I'm yep. like, I'm good with any of them. Yep. Agreed. I'm fascinated to revisit these over the summer when we have quarterback answers for yeah. the Cup. Even the Dolphins. We don't know the status of Tua. What, Correct. What that's going to look like, of course, Devontae Adams as well. Uh, and speaking of quarterbacks, let's move on to your quarterback rankings. Josh Allen still sits at number one. I feel like these are the five guys here, Barry. Not a ton of surprise. Just a matter of how it could be shaken up in any ways. And, of course, once again, kind of waiting for Herbert to take that fantasy leap after what a lot of people would call a disappointing fantasy season. Herbert, to me, is the is sort of the kind of the swing, right? Like, you know, if Lamar is back, if Lamar Jackson's back with the Ravens and Munkins is offense coordinator. And pass like, heavy and, compared and to. Pass heavy. Yeah. Like, do they, do they make a deal for a wide receiver, you know? And, um, uh, you know, there, there were rumors of DeAndre Hopkins going to the Ravens, right? You know, they're like, so... I don't know if that's true or not, but we'll, you know what I mean? Like, if they, if they upgrade their passing attack, they've got Munkin. You could certainly see Lamar Jackson at five. If Kyler Murray's 100% healthy, like, you know, depending on who, who becomes the play caller there in Arizona, you could see an argument for him there as well. Like, 
Um, Justin Fields is the other one. Yeah, he is Fields. a guy who could absolutely finish as the number one player yep. in get fantasy. He's got that upside. Yeah, right. They, they got to get Fields help. That that's something that could propel his rankings up if that but offensive it, line's better and they get a receiver. Yeah, and I think I think they will. I mean, again, remember like he. So another year of Cole Komet, who we like. You know, get, they have Chase Claypool mm-hmm. getting him into the system as well. They lost Darnell Mooney, and I think Darnell Mooney's a, a nice wide receiver. They don't have a true number one. But getting a true number one uh, in Chicago, which given where they're drafting, I mean, they should be able to trade down and still get a true number one, or that could be part of some team trading up to get the number one pick from them. So, yes, I agree with you on, on Fields as well. Yep. He's got um, that kind of upside. Particularly when we've seen the impact that rookie wide receivers apparently can make in the NFL this year. like Not just this year with Olave and Wilson having incredible seasons. Christian Watson was huge down the stretch for yep. Green Bay. But also like Justin Jefferson, what he did in his rookie season. It just seems like there is a higher level of wide receiver play coming out in rookie seasons these, these days. Finally, we close it out with tight end rankings. Number one, the least surprising thing of any rankings, Travis Kelsey. He's the king at the top. But figuring out this group after that Andrews Kittle stack, Barry, is always fascinating. Yeah, I mean, look, it really is because the fact of the matter is, is that I could make an argument for anyone after Kelsey. I mean, you know, uh, besides what, Kyle Pitts. I mean, right? But no, but all seriousness, like you know, uh, you think about Dalton Schultz, number five, right? He's played 31 games with Dak Prescott, including the playoffs over the last two years. He's got 16 touchdowns in 31. He's averaging, you know, you know. A touchdown in over 50% of the games he plays with Dak Prescott. Hawkinson, when he came to Minnesota, if you take out that Week 18 game where they didn't play everyone the full game, he averaged over nine targets a game. And that was coming over in midseason. Right? And so we expect that Kittle is, you know, Kittle's, you know, obviously has a big connection. At, if Brock Purdy's named the yeah. starter. Big connection there. 11 touchdowns, seven of which came from Purdy this year for George Kittle. And, of course, Mark Andrews. You know, another friend of the show, Mark Andrews, another guy I believe who picked the Eagles, but friend of the show, Mark Andrews, came on our air and just talked about the fact that it was an up and down year. But again, if Lamar's back and Munkin, then, I mean, you know, Andrews has finished as the number one tight end in fantasy before. Like, Yeah, absolutely. I think Andrews is the right number two with George Kittle, uh, friend of the show. I uh, had a great chat about hair with George Kittle. Uh, I'd be a little bit... Jay brought that up too, by the way. Like, I'm never... Hair's not a subject that I'm keen on. Like, a lot of different ways you could go when you're talking to George Kittle. He's got great hair. But why, yeah, but why bring up hair? Because it only points out how little I have. That's what I, I was just, going for. I feel was like it was just little... kind of a... I did watch that one. There was quite a, a few subtle digs at you. <laughs> yes. Like Jay, Jay, like, under his breath. By the oh. way, not so subtle. Yeah. No, not no. so subtle. You, yeah. you, it turns out the mics work. I don't yeah. like that you said subtle. It wasn't intended to be no, subtle. No, no, it was yeah. intended to be quite, quite overt. Right in my face, yeah. Uh, I do think with Kittle... Yeah. I would just be a little bit concerned. One, about the quarterback situation. Yeah. could be Trey Lance. We don't have much of a sample of Lance with Kittle. And two, there's just so many guys on that team. There's Debo, Ayuk, uh, McCaffrey out of the backfield. Like, he does yeah. have much more competition than uh, Mark Andrews, who every year has no competition whatsoever yeah, for targets. Target so, share. I think Andrews is right to have two. And uh, I wouldn't be even be surprised if I team. No, I mean, I think you could, like I said, I, if, if you had Kittle at five, I, yeah. You know, I mean, we'll see how the whole season plays out. This is, these are way, way, way too early rankings that will change continually. But, yeah, I could see Hawkinson being three very easily. All right. Moving on, uh, moving on to more way, way too early. Jay, your 2023 NFL futures bets. Let's take a look at the board for 2024 Super Bowl champion odds. This is where things open. No surprise the Chiefs are at the top yeah. with plus 600. And then a pretty big downfall after that with the Bengals at plus 850, a ton of plus 900s. Jay, is there any value on this board? Obviously, there's no value in the Chiefs at the moment, but outside of them. Yeah, there's a couple things. One, I think Philadelphia, they should be favored over San Francisco in the NFC. They should have shorter odds there. I think the Eagles are just, there's just more stability at the quarterback position. Don't even know uh, what San Francisco's situation will be there definitively. When I'm looking at longer shots, what I want is I want quarterback upside. And so one thing that I've been thinking about a lot, um, strange that I think about this a lot, but I do, is just how close the Ravens played the Bengals in that playoff game. And then, yep. and then the Bengals, how they just dismantled uh, the Buffalo Bills and then played the, K- the Kansas City Chiefs incredibly tough as well. So I think Baltimore, they have Super Bowl upside. If they get Lamar back, they add a wide receiver. The Ravens are plus 1,800 there. And then in terms of longer shots, even further down the board. Yeah, why are my commanders not on this list? <laughs> yeah, they're not on the front. Uh, yeah, they're not there. When they get their Kansas quarterback, City they'll find Buffalo. their way. What yeah. are you saying about you Sam Howell? Just keep scrolling down and down until you get to 50-1 to 1 on the commanders. But 
I think the Jags at 25 to 1, just because of Lawrence and the upside, he could make a Joe Burrow type leap. Would anyone be shocked if Trevor Lawrence is top three in MVP next year? He's got that type of talent. Easy division as well. Easy, easy division, and they get some defensive help this season, you know, as well yeah, to, to add respect. to that. I mean, like, for, you, you know, in addition to Lawrence taking another leap and they have nice crew, they have a nice uh, young team around them. They get Calvin Ridley this year. Yeah. They're adding Calvin Ridley to Trevor Lawrence along with Christian Kirk, along with Zay Jones, along – we'll see if Evan Ingram yep. comes back, but my expectation is is that they'll figure something out there. He was on a one-year prove-it deal. I think he did. They like him. He likes them. So uh, – and ETN. I mean, like, all yep. of a sudden you're like, Jaguars they're, offense. They're loaded. They're loaded, in an, to your point, in an easy division. And so if they spend the offseason, basically all we're going to do is fortify our defense. Yep. And then the last one to me, and this is just riding the upside – like, what if Deshaun Watson is just the top three quarterback in the NFL again, which he was in Houston not that long ago? And they have so much talent around him. He gets a full off season there. Uh, they're 40 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. So I think that's just a little bit big when you just think about the upside. Not a bet that you love to place, but I do think that's no. a little bit big. Finally, we look at the uh, my not so early NFL draft prospect rankings here, guys. And we are going to have a lot of fun next summer because there is a running back in the top five this year on my big board and B. John Robinson, who yeah. is just going to be the talk of town in fantasy in the NFL draft. There's already a lot of talk that maybe he can end up somewhere phenomenal like the Eagles. This is a draft that doesn't have a ton of wide receiver talent at the top. Right outside the top 10, you have Jordan Addison from USC, Jackson Smith and Jigba. But when you have skill talent in the top 10 like B. John Robinson, like Michael Mayer at tight end, which we talked about, Barry, looking at your future rankings. Yeah. We are starving at tight end right now in fantasy. Mayer's a guy, along with the rest of this class, whether it's Darnell Washington, Dalton Kincaid, they can have a fantasy impact. So this draft is going to be a lot of fun, not just for the talent at the top, but for the fantasy talent that it, uh, it'll bring right away. Yep. We mentioned uh, rookie wide receivers earlier, the impact that Olave and Wilson had out of the gate. Is there anyone in particular you think could have that type of season? It's a down year. year, but you go back to the Ohio State well again just because yeah. of how well they're coached. Jackson Smith and Jigba did not play a lot this year, but we've also seen that not matter. Jamar Chase right. did not play his final college year. Jackson Smith and Jigba, the good thing too is I think he'll go in the later first round, so that means you're playing probably with a better quarterback, yep. a better team. So it'll be Jackson Smith and Jigba, Jordan Addison, maybe Quentin Johnson from TCU, a bigger wide receiver. So there's always a chance just because of the volume rookie wide receivers often are awarded. Yep. Yeah, I, I think we're going to look back, by the way, just taking one step back from this past year. I think we're going to look back at the rookie wide receiver class, you know, from this past season as, you know, one of the all-time greats. Because, I mean, because, I mean, Olave and Garrett Wilson are the two obvious ones, but, like, there were moments from Jahan Dotson who, like, you know, he, yep. he, he suffered some injuries, but there was, you know, Jahan Dotson had some really nice moments here. Like, and we all forget, like, a full year now, Jamison Williams – in that Detroit offense with Ben Johnson, with Jared Goff, with Amon Ross St. Brown taking the middle away. And, uh, you know, I think Jameson Williams is going to be really interesting next year. What about George Pickens yes, as thank well? You. Yeah. yeah. Drake, George, if Atlanta can get a quarterback, you look at Drake, Drake London, London. Yep. And flashes, but when Traylon Burks was healthy, with yes. not much in Tennessee, he made some plays. So we were spoiled with that class. Christian Watson, uh, a really, really special group this year will not yeah, Christian be Watson like had, that. Christian Watson was great down the stretch, too. Yep. Who so. goes number one, Connor? Bryce Young minus 120 on BetMGM, Stroud plus 250, Jalen Carter and Will Anderson 5-1. to one. It'll be a quarterback because I think the Bears are going to trade that pick yeah. wisely. They, they need to, and I think it'll be Bryce Young, but at the combine it's going to be it's fascinating. Just, I was going to say no C.J. Stroud. I mean, like, you don't think he's in the he's mix? Got, he's got a chance. It's going to be Stroud. It's going to be Will Levis. Anthony Richardson's probably going to go in the top 12, but not on the table to go number one. He's not ready to play. Bryce Young, though, is going to come in around 5'10 and a half. Pl played under 200 pounds. That's unprecedented I, at number I've one. I've said this, but i got to find the photo. I wish I could find the photo. Let me see if I can't find the photo. And a lot of people will point to Kyler Murray. That's not an apt comparison. Kyler was 206 at the combine. He's a much different runner the way he protects his body, and, he, and he's hurt now anyway. So I think Bryce Young goes number one. He's the chalk pick on the betting board, like you yep. said, Jay. Um, those odds were plus 275 back in the fall yep. just because Stroud's been in the mix, the size concerns. So it'll come down to whoever trades up to number one, if they have that size threshold, it's going to hurt Bryce Young, but still going to be the favorite for a while. Well, the value's in Levis, by the way, which I, yeah, yeah. I think Plus I texted you about a month ago. Yeah. Right. The value's in Levis. Here's a picture. I, I'm going I'm to text this to Steven D'Agostino. Maybe he can throw it up there. Um, but this is a picture of – I met Bryce Young at a Super Bowl party last year. I don't know if you can see this. Mm -hmm. I'll show that to you. But so that's me, my buddy Brian, and Bryce Young's the one in the middle. Oh. Um, and uh, that's like I'm, 
I'm taller than him. Oh, I And I feel that. thicker than him. And yes, I mean, yes, I'm I'm a fat <laughs> F, but like, you know, but like, but like, right, I'm 200 pounds. Like yeah. I am six foot, 200 pounds. And I felt like I was bigger than Bryce Young. There are sometimes you meet NFL players or future NFL players and you're like, oh man. Jesus. You know, yeah. like, yeah. how are we the same species? Yeah. They engulf your hand in the handshake. Right. Yep. And I did not feel that way with Bryce Young. Now that was a year ago. So, you know, he's a growing kid and, you know, you bulk up and everything like that. But still, like, the weight will be up for the combine, but I don't know if he's going to get over 200 pounds. And once again, the track record of five foot ten and a half ish quarterbacks in the NFL. I-, I love Bryce Young. I think he's an outlier. You don't bet on outliers in scouting. It's a rule of thumb. Right. But it's, I'm telling you now, it'll be a talking point on yeah. every NFL show for about the next two and a half months. Wow, so. that's super weird because most NFL shows that I watch never be <laughs> run stuff into the ground. But maybe there'll be one Not or this two one. that does that. Um, well, listen, I mean, I run jokes in the ground. That's my sure. stick, you know. But like, anyway, I don't know. Like. So I just sent it to Steve. We probably can't get it up in time. But, uh, like, I'm just – yeah. I mean, he's – he, okay. Uh, the Colts tried up to number one, then Levis is in play. Levis is think. in play. Yeah. Stroud's he's, in play. He's plus 750, yep. Will Levis. I've seen a lot of mock drafts that have the commanders taking Anthony Richardson, which I find surprising. Don't think he'll make it there anymore. Yeah, but, probably not. But would be the fun pick. You let Howell Sam play Hauser for a though. year. What? Sam Howell's our guy, apparently. I, like Sam I, wanted, I wanted Mac Jones. I remember the year Mac Jones came out, and he ended up going two picks ahead of the commanders uh, to the Patriots, obviously. But I wanted him, and, and people were like, ah, you're going gonna to get Mac Jones. I'm like, he's not going to get to us. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's, they go early. That's the problem with the commanders is they're always just good enough to be outside no. the range of getting anyone good. But, you know, not good enough to uh, – yeah, you probably get take... you probably get Mac Jones now if you want. <laughs> I'm not sure, not sure his stock's the highest in New England right I, now. I don't think you could. Um, I, I'm still in on Mac Jones. I'm buying Mac Jones stock, yeah. I buying Mac Jones stock, that, buying that Russell Wilson stock. That was a stock. Me- mess. Yeah. Get Bill O'Brien Bill O'Brien's there. a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big difference. That, they have a Mac decent Jones amount of money to spend too. Let's go. They could add a big money wide receiver if they please, if they choose to. Yeah. I'm, so. I, uh, I would, I would lo- as a Commanders fan, I would love Mac Jones. Absolutely. Bill, give us a call. Yeah. You know, yeah. call no. Matthew directly. Call me, call me directly. I'll make the trade. Um, I mean, listen, you know, we got a good shot. I, I will say one other positive thing that came out. So I was, I don't want to, I want to. I was at a party uh, where I met somebody. I'll tell you guys off air, but like I met, <laughs> I met some, I met somebody who would know. Yes. You know what I mean? I'll just say that somebody who is high up in NFL circles who would know. And I just said, hey man, off the record, like. We get a new owner. Like I'm a diehard Commanders fan. We get a new owner. He's just like you're getting a new owner. So I'm go. like, all right, yeah, there you go. Right. Snyder has his sale in Mar- his house up for sale. His house in the D.C. area. Oh, so he's leaving is town on the market. Too. What? He's leaving town. Like everything's getting left behind. I mean, like I'm just saying, like if you're if you're not selling the team, you're probably not selling your house, right? Yes. In in town, maybe not. I mean, yeah, no, maybe, maybe he still would. Maybe he's trying to downsize. You know, <laughs> this is the trend. Yeah, right, it's just uh, it's, it's, it's a in. Trend. You know, Smaller him, is now in. Him and Tanya are empty nesting, and they're like, ah, we don't we don't need this. You know, seventy thousand foot mansion. We oh, could boy. we could survive in like a forty thousand foot <laughs> mansion. Okay, I mean, by the way, here's the picture. If you wanna if you wanna roll those up, there's me and Bryce Young, like and my buddy Brian. Bryce and, Young, and by the way, just be clear, is the down. one in the middle. You're yeah. looking down. You're not you're not straight up where it's No, um, I'm selfie yeah. style, obviously. Yes. I'm holding it. Looks like the photo of me and George Kittle, but with uh May as Bryce Young in this. So situation. it's not a it's not a great angle and I wish I had one that was like a you know, uh, that was us sort of standing up so you could get an even better sort of guy. sense of it. But um yeah, he's not he's not a you know he's not the biggest guy in the world. I, you know, and I don't think I'm I don't think I'm speaking out of school to say that. Guys, have had a lot of fun this year doing this show, and uh, too, I say that because we are heading into a little break. <laughs> so uh, before we do take that break, we did put together our lovely producing team put together a best of sizzle wow. for us wow. that we want to throw. By the to. way, let's hear for the let's hear for the producing team that had to sift through a whole year to find it. <laughs> I thought about that I was on my like, ride How in. long is this? Like you yeah. know, I thought about that on my way, and I was like, how much time did that take to think of all of our best? Like moments? looking for uh, Sam Ellinger highlights. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm, right, exactly. I'm like, I, I'm like, I wonder what's on this scissor. I have no idea. I haven't seen the reel yet, but I wonder if it's literally just two minutes of me saying like, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Peace out. Five like o'clock it's somewhere. Just, it's just right. Exactly. Is it just like? It's really a soundboard. It's just really. You just is it, press is the soundboard. Is it? That's the best part of the show is when we're off the air. So it's just going off like. Um, let's find out. It, let's let's find out now. So here you go. Some highlights 
from the year that was on Fantasy Football Happy Hour. Let's go, Isaiah Pacheco, score two touchdowns, score two touchdowns against the Bengals. Give Peace a chance, give Pitts a chance. How about that? Give uh, the best angle. Missing layups while we're hitting threes. I we're draining three. Uh, Steph, Curry, been, Steph Curry over here, yeah. which, you know. Whatever. So y'all been, sit, over so here. Y'all been yeah. sitting on this for 15 weeks. Rick McKillick, so y'all just now complaining about my seating right here? Yeah. I don't know if you heard this, but so it's a two, it's a fourteen team two quarterback league that Jay and I are playing in with all the. Staff. I'm in it. Oh, you're in that. Yes. League? Okay, right. <laughs> it's fourteen teams. I wasn't told to learn the everyone's names. Fourteen teams. This is a nominee for you know uh, the best uh, peacock. A peacock. Yeah. This is a best peacock nominee. Best yeah. cinematography. My bald head right up into a peacock butt. Where are you guys at on men calling other men juicy? I, I ain't, I'm extremely I ain't finna it, call but. no. I'm not calling nobody juicy when we talk about football. I'm not I, doing it. Everyone's like what you're grateful for, what you're thankful for. That's what I'm thankful for. No, Josh Jacobs. Yeah, whatever. I got healthy kids and a wife. Blah, 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 blah. No, no. no. It's, it's, the, the important stuff here yeah. is, you know, didn't play against Josh Jacobs. Zach, are, are you on the TB12 diet? Uh, no, that... I'm on the chicken finger diet. Okay, I like no, that. No, is what I am. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I'm on the, I'm, yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the, I'm on the chicken finger and choco taco diet. Rest in peace, I'm, choco I, taco. I, I've been hoarding them. We're not going to do up. body shots, though. Not on I, yours. Yeah, not on mine. I suggested All right. it. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, if you, if you want to use it, you know, wash for stomach right yeah, here. Yeah, oh, really? Okay. Okay, no. And God forbid Josh Allen throw more than one touchdown pass. God forbid Saquon Barkley gets more than 30 yards against the Lions. The Lions, Saquon Barkley. Please Great stop, happened please stop jiggling. Please I stop refuse. jiggling. Now I'm going to jiggle even more. Oh, I'm going to jiggle even more. This is a victory jiggle. Put Kyle Pitts in. Let him know, beat dog. Tell you what you didn't win. The hearts of America. The hearts of Falcons fans, the hearts of Kyle Pitts' mom. I'll tell you, you didn't win any of that. All you won was two losses. That's right. And I don't even know if that makes sense. You won losses because that's all you've got to show for yourself, Arthur Smith. Free Kyle Pitts. And he go off in week three. We just going to say, woo! <laughs> to be clear, only Lawrence Jackson said woo. I was not going to woo. Like, I feel like. Lawrence and Ric Flair are really the only two people that should ever be allowed to woo. I thought my therapy sessions had gotten me past the victory jiggle, but there, <laughs> there it is again, just right back. <laughs> Got to go straight back. Oh, uh, yeah, it gets uh, me every time. That kind therapist to help to, me through uh, the victory jiggle. To, to bring it back, yeah. If, if you couldn't get enough of the best moments, we have more. There's an extended cut. It'll is be there? on the NFL on NBC YouTube channel well, where you can also watch this show in full. Um, so, yes, if you want more of the best moments, that wasn't enough for you. Yeah. Right, more. exactly. Um, yeah, not bad. It's fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> not Review. Bad. Not bad. Well, you fun. know what? I just, uh, I, I will say this, uh, in all seriousness, I had so many people camp, it, and it's always, you know, it's always flattering when people recognize you and they come up and they say they're a fan, they want a, a selfie, whatever it is. And so I, I met so many people Super Bowl week. And what was crazy to me is two person, they all said the same thing. You know, they'd say, hey, I'm a fan, and can I get a picture, can I, you know, whatever. And, but they would also say, like, Congrats on the move to NBC, and you seem so happy. They always, every single one of them, you you seem so much happier at NBC, and I'm like, because I am, because <laughs> I am. No you know, it. I mean, like, you know, again, no disrespect to my former place, but because I am, and I think I'm, I think I'm looser on this show that I, as a broadcaster, I think I, uh, I think, genuinely, I'm I'm happier, and there's more space to breathe, and. Uh, it's been an absolute thrill getting to know both of you guys. Both of you guys have done great work um, Your reward this year, and your reward for the great work is that you're stuck with me, and you have to do it again next year. <laughs> there are um, and you're, uh, uh, you know, but uh, it's been an awesome year, guys. Great season. It's been it, fun. It's been a lot of fun. I've been uh, very thankful to be a part of it. and We've had a blast, and I can't wait to see what next year brings. So we did a sappy ending in at the Super Bowl. I watched it. Yeah, uh, um, and I didn't mention Blake Friedman. Our, oh, our researcher who's done a great I job all year. That. I didn't mention Adam Wise, who helps us out with uh, guests and, and our YouTube production and, and uh, makes me read ad reads. Um, <laughs> but don't hold that against him. He's just doing his job. But, um, so I want to give a special shout out to each of those guys. Blake Friedman's a diehard Eagles fan. So it's just a tough putt um, uh, for uh, Blake. But, you know, Blake, I just, as a, um, as a thank you for all of your service this year, and to apologize because I was doing stuff off the top of my head. Feels like, you know, honestly, as the researcher, you shouldn't give me a list of everyone to mention. <laughs> so it's kind of your own fault that I didn't have a list there at the end of the show last week. But just, 
I just, I have one photo. This is um, on the way out of the airport. This will make you feel better. This will make you feel better, Stephen. I don't know if you have that photo, uh, but there's uh, just a quick photo that I saw on my way out of the Phoenix oh, airport no, Monday morning. Yeah, Monday morning, I was leaving Phoenix, coming, flying back here to uh, beautiful Connecticut so I could do the show. And uh, Stephen, if you just want to run this photo here for Blake, there it is. <laughs> you can see their Eagles Super Bowl gear now 50% off, steal. Stephen. <laughs> just a steal, just an absolute. So that's just, nice I think, good for you. It's a nice quarter zip there that literally is half price. <laughs> the morning after, half price, their Super Bowl gear. So that, you should have uh, uh, grabbed uh, one. I thought Blake. about that. It would have been the right call. Would have been the right call to do. Should have been a Chiefs I, one, full press. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't need. I grabbed some Super Bowl swag for my kids. You know, like <laughs> Dad's been. Well, you know, so I grabbed stuff for for all my kids. I should have done that because it was only fifty percent off. Like I mean, it's <laughs> dirt cheap. They're. Um, yeah, tough, tough scene at the airport. Wow. But anyway. <laughs> Just some bullets for Blake Friedman on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> to win the Massive season. drive by yeah. <laughs> for a man that has worked so hard on the show. He's done a great job. Day in and day out. Hey, Blake, how was, how was it working with Barry this year? <laughs> <laughs> this is great. It's like I run over on the very last show. Yeah. Very last it's part by, of the very last uh, show. By a train. <laughs> yeah. All right. There you go. Uh, all right, so I think we're done. We're right? done. We're Couple we uh, see you in a few weeks. See you in a few weeks. I don't so know what we, the that show means. will go dark for a few weeks, uh, and then we will be back and start our off-season schedule. We will be live from the NFL Combine. We'll be at the NFL Draft. We'll have cover free agency left, right, six ways till Sunday. So keep the feet open because you will hear from us again. But so for everyone on the Fantasy Football Happy Hour and Jay Croucher and Connor Rogers, I am Matthew Barry. Listen. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotor World, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.